A sermon for the first Sunday of Lent, year B. Homunculus. Before we understood genetics, before there was any understanding of DNA, before Mendel and his peas or Darwin aboard the Beagle, there was the idea that each and every one was formed in fullness and in miniature within the bodies of men. Microscopic humans floating around within the bodies of their ancestors, like some sort of eternal set of Russian nesting dolls. Homunculus among us might seem ridiculous, but for some of our ancestors in the faith, this concept helped to make sense of the flood. You see, if Cain and Abel were miniature men in the body of Adam, and within them were little humans, and within those little humans were little humans, then that means that every one of those little humans was present when Adam ate the apple. When Adam bit, so did we. Hence the origin of original sin, at least according to Aquinas, who learned it from Aristotle, and who then passed it down in various permutations through the church. The church, universal, which is why the first eight stanzas of poet James Weldon Johnson's Noah Built the Ark aren't about Noah or the Ark, but rather about the sins of Adam. And lest we think that that was so then and this is now, the beloved King's College Lessons and Carols always begins with Adam's sin. Adam lay abandoned and so came the flood which is how we got here. Because in the invitation to a Holy Lent, we are reminded that Lent has traditionally been a time when those who because of notorious sins had been separated from the body of the faithful were reconciled by penitence and forgiveness and restored to the fellowship of the church. If we aren't going to talk about sin in Lent, when are we going to talk about it? Keep in mind that this is not an argument for original sin, for in our making, in our origin, there was no sin, but only goodness as declared by our creator. Our creator whose requirement of us as defined in our catechism, which is in the Book of Common Prayer. The requirement is to be faithful, to love justice, to do mercy and to walk humbly with God. So sin, it's when we aren't doing what's required of us. To be faithful, to love justice, to do mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Sin is not a result of Adam, but about the abuse of the freedom that we have been given and our exploitation of that which God has made. So, we are beginning Lent today with an exploration of the role of sin in our lives and in our faith. Because, O oh, happy fault, the Easter Vigil's exalted declares. Happy fault? What is this? Good Friday? God's response to sin is exactly where our joy is to be found. And Lent frames the assertion that we can come back from the brink, that no sin is unforgivable, and that we can be restored, even now. Because arguably, there can be no rainbow without the storm. And if we had no sin, we would have no need of Christ. However, I'm not ready for the rainbow yet, on this, the first Sunday in Lent, because as I read this text, I know that there are no bows in the cloud which can restore those who are lost. And this is a text that I cannot take as a given. I can't hear this story without seeing the devastation that precedes the moment that we tell about the rainbow. It is said, to study scripture in the Anglican tradition is to wrestle with the word of God, like Jacob in the wilderness, and sometimes to come away wounded. Wrestling with the text 
does not devalue it. Instead, this wrestling assumes that there is something within that text worth the struggle and our effort. To wrestle with the text is to honor it as worthy of our effort. So we're going to wrestle with the moment which precedes the moment we heard proclaimed today. That moment when God tells Noah, I am going to put an end to all people for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And when God further instructs Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. This is a painful moment. This is the kind of moment that rends the heart and causes us to question our faith. And this is also the moment when Noah really, really screws up. Now, Noah didn't screw up by building an ark or following God's directions. Noah screws up because he doesn't argue with God. He doesn't wrestle with the words he has heard. Noah doesn't speak on behalf of the innocent children who will surely die. Noah doesn't point out the ecological devastation that will be wrought. Adam may have lay abandoned, but Noah did not loosen the chains. Now, I am not the first to wrestle with this moment and to find Noah at fault. In the 13th century rabbinical book, the Zohar, the rabbis imagined a post-apocalyptic conversation between God and Noah, a conversation in which Noah is judged harshly for not arguing with God. I lingered with you, spoke to you at length so that you would ask for mercy for the world. But as soon as you heard that you would be safe in the ark, the evil of the world did not touch your heart. You built the ark and saved yourself. Now that the world has been destroyed, you open your mouth to utter questions and pleas. Noah built an ark for his own family, loaded it with what was needed for their survival and sailed away from the devastation. Framed in this fashion, Noah is easy to judge. And yet, that conclusion, that judgment, does not to seem to me particularly Christian. For judge not, lest we be judged. And I find that I can't blame Noah. He is me and me is we. And I think we can all empathize with his priorities. For who wouldn't choose to save their own children given the chance? Do you remember how when the city burned, we hosed down our own homes? Do you remember all of the impossible choices we faced during the COVID-19 shutdowns? I can't find it in me to blame Noah for making a choice I myself might have made. And that leaves me to wonder, was God's covenant with Noah and his descendants, was it made because God recognized that left to our own devices, we will fail to keep covenant with one another? Is the rainbow a reminder that God cannot trust us to intervene on behalf of our fellow humans and so will always act with love, knowing that our love will fall short? This seems a somewhat cynical and not particularly hopeful view of the rainbow, but therein, Therein, I am finding the hope. You know, sometimes I joke quite seriously that one of the most useful prayers I offer is, God, you're going to have to love them 
because I just can't right now. I joke seriously because there is truth in this prayer because I know that my capacity for compassion, for love in action, is a far cry from the kind of love that God has for us. I will and I do fall short of that Christ-like, God-like love, which we are called to emulate. And that for me today is the grace, the truth that God loves us more than we love us. And in exploring this text, I find that my focus is no longer on the flood, the destruction, or even on the rainbow, but on the opportunity we've been given to grow in love. My focus has turned from sin and towards the truth that there is nothing that we can do that would keep God from loving us. We can come back from the brink. We can be restored. And that is the good news. And so we've wrestled with the text. And out of that wrestling comes compassion. Compassion for those who faced with impossible choices and the danger of the wilderness. Mistake captivity for redemption. Judge not, but for the grace of God go I. Amen.